What's going on? It's the Polygon Don, and today I want to talk about the top 10 action games on PS4 that are always ignored. Games I feel deserved a lot more fanfare than they received at the time of release. Some had unlucky launch windows, while others were straight up treated like they didn't exist. There's a few common traits through all of them though. They're excellent action games, they're massively underrated, and I believe are all worthy of a spot in your collection. But I'm not going to waffle on any further. Let's get stuck in, shall we? Number 10. Cult classic Nintendo DS game from 2007, The World Ends With You, finally got the sequel Die Hard fans were pleading for for years in 2021 when Neo The World Ends With You was released. Releasing on Switch, PS4 and Windows, I'm assuming Square Enix were hoping the multi-platform approach this time round would bring more attention to this incredibly stylistic action RPG. But alas, that just wasn't the case. Selling well below expectations, any future titles in the series seems incredibly doubtful now, which is a crying shame as this is such a great action game that way more people need to experience. Whoa, it's like a movie! Set in Shibuya, Tokyo, you'll play as Rindo, a teenage boy obsessed with gaming who, along with his friend Fret, find themselves transported to an alternate version of Tokyo inhabited with monsters and are now part of a vastly different and more visceral type of game, ominously dubbed the Reaper's Game. Competing with other teams, you'll need to take on daily missions and defeat the monsters you come across in order to eventually free yourself from this nightmare. The story's great and the characters are all really charming and likeable, so you get drawn in really quickly. What feels like button mashy combat at first develops much more nuance as the game progresses with the later stages providing a challenge that was welcome and fair. There's leveling systems and RPG mechanics to get stuck into, and also the art style and music are all top tier and worth mentioning too. I never played the original DS game or even its eventual port to the Switch, but I sure am glad the fans of it were loud enough to get this sequel green lit. It's just a shame more people haven't played it to appreciate it. Well worth seeking out and not skipping over next time you're game hunting. Was nothing. Yeah! <laughs> Bye -bye! You've got the wrong vector! Number 9 Hey, what is it? You okay? Yo, Louie. You smell that? Yeah. Human blood. Labelled by almost all the gaming outlets at the time as anime Dark Souls, Code Vein certainly has its fans, but considering how good this game is, I feel like the Anime Souls moniker it was given almost did its launch a disservice. Saying that, it did release in 2019, when it felt like any action game coming out at that time was a so-called Souls-like. Even massive franchises like Star Wars were having a stab at it with Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. I mean, FromSoft themselves released Sekiro that year too, so maybe Code Vein was destined to be ignored. But to simply or rather reductively call it just anime Dark Souls probably didn't help matters either. Set in the future, humanity finds itself at the point of extinction after a devastating global event known as the Great Collapse has brought misery and ruin to the world. To stand even a chance of survival, the human population that remained created revenants. The reanimated corpses of the fallen that use a parasite in the heart to spring back to life. With no memory of their former selves, revenants are instead driven solely by their thirst for human blood. Thankfully for the last few humans that remain, the revenants can also quench their insatiable thirst by discovering blood seeds that grow in the world. However, these are becoming more and more scarce, and to go too long without blood, a revenant will find themselves transforming into another beast entirely known as the Lost. You'll play as a revenant with no memory, so pretty much like every other RPG out there, and soon you band together with a crew who quickly realise your revenant abilities are unlike anything anyone has seen before. Sounds by the numbers when I put it like that, but it does get pretty interesting, and unlike the item description detective work you need to do with the Souls series, this story is explicitly told to you via cutscenes and character stories via something in-game called Blood Echoes. Gothic anime visuals aside, of which I am a massive fan of by the way, it has an atmosphere that's wholly unique with a great sense of discovery during moments of exploration. 
His combat is precise and satisfying, with the most notable addition being the AI-controlled partner that will accompany you and aid you in battle. Much like the insanely detailed character creator at the beginning of the game, Code Vein lets you customise and re-customise your character's abilities and powers as many times as you want and in ways that go far deeper than just your bog standard skill tree. I mean it gets real deep, so you can truly fine tune your character to fit your style or switch things up and experiment when you find yourself stuck on a challenging boss. It's a really systems heavy game that clearly wears all its inspirations on its sleeves. If you happen to be a Soulsborne fan, then to dismiss this is to deprive yourself of an excellent action adventure and one that brings plenty of its own ideas to the table. That's something. <laughs> Expectations exceeded. That settles it. You are absolutely vital to our operation. Number eight. Young Rentier, still on your father's leash, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Heard you were on your way to the gathering, Chess. What's this? Catering? Why, I have no idea what you. <laughs> one of the newest games on this list, but unfortunately not one with the greatest story. However, where it lacks in narrative, Evil West more than makes up for in combat and good old fashioned fun. You'll be playing as Jesse Rentier, an agent for a secret government agency run by his father that hunts down vampires. After discovering a conspiracy that endangers the entire planet, it's down to Jesse to put a stop to it. Set just after the American Civil War, the band of unlikely heroes that accompany Jesse in his crusade against the terrors of the night are refreshing and likeable despite the occasional cheesy dialogue. Like I said, the story isn't something that will stay with you forever, but it is decent enough and doesn't really get in the way of enjoying what Evil West is best at, beating the living daylights out of vampires. Combat is fast, punchy and very satisfying. The gradual addition of abilities as the story progresses constantly keeps the combat encounters feeling fresh, as does the roster of enemies that you'll be pounding to the ground. Using a third person perspective, you'll shoot a variety of firearms while simultaneously punching and electrifying your enemies using a melee system that feels weighty and deliberate. What feels heavy and slow at first quickly evolves into something a lot more speedy and visceral as you unlock more tricks and weapons. Some of the presentation in this game make it look more like a AAA game than a AA game it really is. Especially if you play it on PS5 and use the free upgrade that you get when purchasing the physical PS4 version. The art direction along with the lighting and colour palette makes some scenes just absolutely pop, but then there are other times where things can look a little muddled and confusing, especially during some daylight encounters where the contrasting just felt really off. Thankfully, being a vampire hunter, most of the game takes place at night where it all looks absolutely incredible. It definitely has its quirks and even though its efforts are valiant, it isn't a AAA title. However, there is a ton of fun to be had here and when so many action games are either going for heavy adult themed stories or super deep stat systems and mechanics, it's nice to come across a game that prioritises dumb fun over anything else. You used to see way more games like this during the PS3 and 360 generation, when the big publishers were just putting out more games than they do today and therefore taking more risks. I really hope this isn't the last we see from this franchise. A few creases ironed out and future entries in the series could be something very special indeed. Number seven. What is darkness but lurking sun? What is war but enslaved stone? What is glass but tortured sand? What is song but a call to arms? What is hate but jilted love? What is life but death pending? In at number seven, sticking with the blood sucking vampire theme, we have Vampyr, another double A game and one developed by Don't Nod. A third person action RPG with detective crime solving elements and set in London in 1918, 
You'll play as Jonathan Reed, a field doctor returning to London after his service during the First World War. Only he wakes to find himself in a mass grave and definitely not dead. Jonathan is now a vampire and after a tragic opening scene involving a family member is desperate to find out who did this to him. Realising this epidemic is sweeping through London and with the help of a surgeon who knows his secret, he enlists his medical services to a hospital in the East End. Here he learns more about the plague's origins as well as others who share a similar biological situation to his own. You'll be given quests to go on where you can defeat vampires, cleansing the city streets and levelling up in the process, but this is only minimal. The real trick to levelling up is to give in to your newfound vampiric desires and devour the citizens of London. The more you know of a person, the more XP you gain from killing them, so it pays to be patient and observant in order to get the most out of your meal. Getting to know them intimately before chomping on them will net you a massive amount of XP you can use to unlock further deadly abilities. It's a little bit tricksy like that, this game. Basically, the more evil you become, the more powerful you become, the easier the game gets. Want to be true and kind to those around you and hang on to any humanity that might remain? You're welcome to do so and there's even a trophy in it for you, but the game becomes a lot more difficult should you wish to play the hero. The combat is definitely borrowing from the Soulsborne genre, most specifically Bloodborne, but maybe that's down to its gothic setting and atmosphere too. Either way, I definitely had flashbacks of Bloodborne whilst playing this, which in my book is never a bad thing. Unlike the previous game mentioned, this relies heavily on its story to keep momentum and does so fantastically well. It's completely captivating throughout, as is the voice performance of the actor playing Jonathan. This is absolute madness. I've lost touch with the real. He just has one of those voices that commands attention and conveys the protagonist's sense of conflict at being a vampire brilliantly. But I do have to mention, there is a lot of talking in this game. It's very wordy. You could even argue that there's more dialogue than there is combat, and if the characters were any less realised, it would probably fall flat on its face. But the fact that they're all brilliantly scripted and acted makes the world that much more believable and engrossing. And anyone that does annoy you can easily be silent, so win-win-win if you ask me. Seriously, check this creepy and unique game out when you next get the opportunity. It's bloody fantastic. Death. Since the apple was plucked from the sacred tree, mortality was believed to be God's punishment. A righteous snare to keep mankind from ascending to the stars. They were all so wrong. Death is not a wicked thing, nor some holy retribution. A true punishment would be to never know its sweet Number six. An other alert, but today's forecast said the threat level here was zero. <laughs> what? Others? What are they doing in the city? <laughs> All units, double time! Go on the second wave through! Scarlet Nexus by Bandai Namco is a game I feel like a lot of people glossed over. Releasing in 2021 on both PS4 and PS5, it had a decent marketing push at the time and I remember a lot of people talking up their hype for it online. Then it released with positive reviews and that was pretty much the end of it. I'm not sure what put people off, I mean it is one of those games where you choose one of two characters at the start and to get the whole story you need to eventually play as both. And I've got to admit, I'm not usually a massive fan of that, so maybe that was a contributing factor. But the combat just feels and looks so good, in the end I was only too happy to have an excuse to dive in some more. The boss designs are weird and gross in the best kind of way and really don't pull their punches either, even on normal difficulty, so there is a challenge and a sense of achievement there. It also has a very strong emphasis on story, world building and character development and I genuinely wasn't expecting it to be as engrossing as it was. You'll play as Yuito, a member of the Other Suppression Force or OSF, and they're the vanguard at protecting the world from the creatures and monsters ominously called the Others. 
Members of the OSF aren't your average everyday citizens, however. They possess certain unique abilities, and the two main protagonists, Yuito and Kasane, are both able to control and hurl items around them using psychokinesis. While other members in your party might be able to control fire, for example, or turn invisible. Along with weapons for melee combat, they're definitely the right people for the job. The combat is fast and fluid and is almost immediately easy to get to grips with. It's actually one of the strongest elements of the game and was thoroughly enjoyable and addictive throughout. You gradually unlock your main arsenal of abilities in the opening hours as you accompany various members of your team on missions to defeat enemies. You can also borrow the abilities of whoever is tagging along for the ride and that little added feature alone makes almost every mission feel fresh and unique. Defeating enemies grants points that can be used to level up via a skill tree that adds even more tricks up your sleeve to experiment with, so there's no resting on your laurels here and plenty of opportunity to get creative. I was a little disappointed at first when I realised that the majority of the story exposition was done via comic book style static artwork rather than fully fleshed out cutscenes, but once I was stuck into the story I didn't care about that at all. What I did care about was the motley crew of characters that accompany you. They're all either really likeable or purposefully loathsome and it's just great getting to know them all over the course of the game. Actually, what struck me most was the Persona vibes that I got whilst playing. Whether that was from the hideout sequences where you and your party get some downtime to chat and improve friendships and bonds, or the jazzy electronica that permeated through the entire experience. They definitely managed to capture some of that distinctive Persona essence and weaved it in here rather nicely. Meanwhile, combat bears a closer resemblance to something that Platinum Games would make, like Bayonetta or even Nier. So it's definitely a cocktail of ideas, an intoxicating and very tasty cocktail in fact. And using contemporary mechanics and design choices that already have a proven track record with consumers and fans would seem like the quickest route to success. But as is the case with Scarlet Nexus, not always. This has such a lot going for it and is a fantastic foundation for potential sequels. I just hope Bandai Namco don't wimp out and pull the plug on this completely as I'd love to see more from this series in the future. Number five. Hey everyone, you love me, don't you? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Then you can give me all your desires. <laughs> Whoa! What the hell was that? There's no time. We'll figure it out later. Joker, Skull, let's fight our way out. Persona 5 Strikers is a spin-off from the wildly successful Persona 5 and Persona 5 Royal, with a story that's essentially a straight-up sequel. You'd think that the mainline game's worldwide success would have been enough to make Strikers sell like hotcakes, but that just wasn't the case. Whether it was the Musu's like Sea of Enemies style action replacing turn-based combat or the fact that Strikers released so close to Persona 5 Royal, whatever the case may be, people just weren't drawn to this like they were to Persona 5. That's not to say that Strikers didn't review well, it reviewed really well, but the number of people that actually picked it up to play differs dramatically from those that played Persona 5. I mean, I'm one of those people, having devoted over 100 hours to Persona 5, I did exactly the same thing all over again and for even longer when just a few years later Persona 5 Royal came out. I even got the Platinum in it that time round and consider it one of my favourite JRPGs of all time. However, even after watching and reading all the positive reviews for Strikers at the time, I just wasn't bothered enough to check it out. Thankfully, it wasn't long till I started seeing copies of the game go for dirt cheap on Amazon, so I decided to pick one up and added it to my backlog. And thank god I did as I finally got round to playing it and I can confirm that it is absolutely brilliant and all the rave reviews were completely bang on. Set literally only a couple of months after the conclusion of Royal, the Phantom Thieves are back together having met up during the summer break and intend on going on a vacation. However, it's not long until they realise that people nationwide are acting irrationally and having changes of heart. 
With little to no leads, the police assume the Phantom Thieves are to blame and so begins the group's journey to clear their names. Developed by Omega Force, the people behind the millions of Dynasty Warriors games and the billion spin-offs they each have, I was kind of expecting more of the same, but I'm happy to report that they have managed to incorporate a lot of things that made Persona 5's combat so addictive into their take on the action genre. The element system of exploiting enemy weaknesses are here along with the scene-stealing showtime events. It's fast, fun and very addictive once you get into the swing of things and with all the hallmarks and characteristics that made the mainline entry ooze with charm. There's a ton to keen off over here if you're a Persona fan, so don't be fooled like me and write this off just because it doesn't have the turn-based combat of Royal. It's absolutely brilliant and 100% worthy of the Persona branding as well as a spot in your collection. And man, does it feel cosy seeing these guys again. Being at the hideout in LeBlanc with all the jazzy music playing instantly brought a massive smile to my face. Number 4 Developed by the now disbanded Japan Studio, a first party Sony development studio comprised of multiple smaller teams that have over the years been involved in some of PlayStation's most iconic IP, and some genuinely unique and fairly experimental titles. Unfortunately, they also had a tendency to, on occasion, develop incredible games that largely went unnoticed by the masses. Gravity Rush 2 and its prequel seem to fit into all three of those categories. It has the look and feel of a big budget AAA first party release, it has some insanely innovative ideas and experimental mechanics working for it, but it's also rather sadly yet another incredible game that's been largely ignored by the millions of people who own a PS4. You'll play as Cat and once reunited with her celestial pet, an actual cat named Dusty, can manipulate the effects of gravity. You can fly or rather gracefully fall in any direction. Once airborne, you pick a destination using the reticule and switch gravity to fall into that direction. It takes a little while to feel accustomed to it and can get disorientating in the first few hours, but man, once it clicks, there literally isn't anything else out there that gives you that same sense of exhilaration. Combat is a big aspect of the game and mastering the gravity manipulation mechanic is key to coming out on top. Not only can you hurl yourself at enemy weak spots, you can also scoop up debris and objects that surround you using your stasis abilities to gain a small round of projectiles that you can use in ranged combat. As you progress, you unlock new abilities and the further you get into the story, you also unlock new gravity styles that affect not only the way you attack, but also the way you move. The animation of Kat as she falls through the world is brilliant. Her hair and her clothes all flapping in the wind really sell that feeling of free falling. The world and the NPCs you come across are all so colourful that it just begs to be explored. Especially as the currency used to upgrade Cat's abilities are these pink so-called precious gems that are literally found everywhere and in hard to reach locations. So exploring not only increases Cat's arsenal of abilities but it also aids you in honing your skill at controlling Cat. I just found it a completely addictive gameplay loop. The only downside to the game really was that some of the side missions tended to feel a little lacklustre fetch quests and escort missions, that sort of thing. Which is a shame as the main story was just fantastic. Gorgeous in every way, the addictive and unique gameplay gives you a feeling of satisfaction and excitement that no other game in the PS4's vast library can offer. If you haven't played this incredible console exclusive, then I highly suggest rectifying that sharpish. Number three. Walk away. Boys, let's kill this guy. Die! 
it's too late for you. You're already dead. The hell are you talking about? Based off of the manga and anime series of the same name, Fist of the North Star Lost Paradise is probably the first video game adaptation of this source material to actually get its visceral violence right. And what better development studio could you possibly pick to take the reins than Ryu Gagatoku, the team behind the once niche but now highly regarded Yakuza or Like a Dragon series. Honestly guys, this is a match made in heaven. I love the Yakuza series, but this is up there with Yakuza 0 in my opinion, and I regard that as one of, if not the best, in the Brawler series. Set in a post-apocalyptic 1980s wasteland that bears more than a little resemblance to the world of Mad Max, you'll be playing as Kenshiro, the game's main protagonist, who practices a lost form of martial arts known as Hokuto Shinkan. This gets him into all sorts of scraps with the local bad guys and villains as they constantly try to get a rise out of and ultimately best him. Story-wise, it's your standard run-of-the-mill rescue the damsel in distress. Nothing new to see here, but what you really play this game for is its combo-based, hyper-unrealistic and super-violent combat. Its satisfying melee combat combined with its excellent art style, character design and its ridiculously over-the-top yet completely welcome death animations make it stand out in the crowd. Its light RPG mechanics and sphere-like leveling system that kind of reminded me of the Final Fantasy X sphere grid allows you to grow Kenshiro into a pretty much unstoppable force. And witnessing that force, even controlling it, is nothing short of exhilarating. Trying out new moves in the game was just so much fun as you have no clue what level of outrageousness the devs were going to throw at you next. And just like in the Yakuza series, there is also a ton of things to do in this apocalyptic wasteland that keeps you coming back hungry for more. There are so many charming and comical side missions and mini games to get distracted with that provide hours of additional yet completely optional fun. I'm hoping that with Like a Dragon's massive success, people go back into Ryugar's back catalogue of games and discover this gory little gem. Whether you're a fan of the original manga or not, you don't need to be to have an absolute blast with this game. Similarly, there's enough of a difference to the Yakuza series that if you weren't that keen on them, you shouldn't automatically write this one off. If, however, like me, you are a fan of the Yakuza series and haven't dived into this yet, then boy oh boy, do you have a treat waiting for you. Number two. Mad Max by Avalanche Studios is arguably the most criminally underrated game on this list. The only reason it doesn't claim the top spot is that it's been documented as such more and more frequently as time has passed. It's still not been played by nearly enough people as it deserves, however, which is why it's still included. A massive open world RPG using a well-known IP and given a AAA budget to work with, and by all accounts the devs did exceptionally well at realising their vision and delivered a fantastic game. So what went wrong with Mad Max? Unfortunately for the developers, their labour of love's launch was sandwiched between two other massive AAA open world RPGs using well-known IPs. Metal Gear Solid 5 and The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. I mean, if you know anything about these two games, it starts to paint a pretty clear picture, doesn't it? I mean, Metal Gear Solid 5 came out literally the day after Mad Max and had so much hype and build up for it, I think most people, myself included, only had space in their lives for one massive game at that time. And after playing Metal Gear Solid 5, I played Bloodborne. And then after that, The Witcher 3. So my calendar, at least, was stacked with regards to big, lengthy RPGs. Which, unfortunately, I think was the case for a lot of people. You ate well in 2015 if you had an appetite for open world games, put it that way. But man, what a game this is. Released just a few months after the movie Mad Max Fury Road, the game follows in its footsteps at providing an average to middling story that is carried purely by incredible non-stop action and a brilliantly realised future wasteland. 
The hand-to-hand -hand melee combat borrows a lot from the Batman Arkham games and there's guns too, but they're scarcely used. Instead, it's all about the punch and the crunch and it's all the better for it, in my opinion. But that's not the only combat in the game. There's also an incredibly well-built vehicular combat system in place too, so that whether you're on foot or behind the wheel, you'll be fighting something. And I have to say, unlike Batman Arkham Knight, for example, where the missions that involved the Batmobile felt more like a chore than it should ever feel, I couldn't bloody wait to jump into my car in Mad Max and explore the wasteland, mowing down fools that dared to challenge me. What makes it more addictive is that much like the character progression and levelling up that you expect with an open world RPG, you can, with a little help from friendly inbred mechanic Chum Bucket, do the same with your vehicle, the Magnum Opus. In fact, clearing out areas of vermin, gathering and looting parts and completing quests to buy that new devastating front bumper is pretty much the main hook of the game. So whether you want a fast paced car that leaves your opponents eating dust or a tank with monster truck wheels to plough straight through them is completely up to you. And this game gives you plenty of customization options for progression to make your Max and your Magnum Opus feel really unique. If this game has eluded you, even after all these years, then now is just as good a time as any to jump straight in. You regularly see this for under £10, whether physically or digitally in sales, and at that price you'd be mad to turn it down. Number one. In Fuxia, I got this. My man, away! You done good. You restored order to the night market. Well, you took a chance on me, Winston. I wanted to make sure it paid off. You got the right attitude. It's gonna pay off for you. Taking the crown for the most criminally underrated and always ignored action game on the PS4 is Sleeping Dogs by United Front Games. Technically a PS3 game first and foremost, but the PS4 had a definitive edition which featured all the DLC and along with a new lick of paint, and the simple fact that nobody played either is the reason I'm choosing the PS4 version today. Set in Hong Kong, you'll play as Wei Shen, an undercover cop tasked with infiltrating the gang he used to roll with as a troublesome teen, working your way up the food chain so to speak so you eventually get access to bigger and badder gangs to take down. The story does a really good job at keeping you questioning where your loyalties lie as you experience Wei's struggle with his dual personas in real time. I mean don't get me wrong, the story isn't breaking any new ground or anything, but I was quite surprised at how much it sucked me in and actually made me care about the characters involved. Being open world, it features a lot of the mechanics from open world games of that time. Think GTA 5, Red Dead Redemption, that sort of thing. You can go anywhere from the jump, commandeer vehicles, shoot guns and surprisingly parkour through a lot of the environments. It's not as robust or as fluid a system as say something like Assassin's Creed, but it does add an extra level of dynamism to traversal and exploration that I wasn't expecting. Nor was I expecting it to be primarily a third person brawler. Opting for fisticuffs for combat encounters most of the time over firearms was a stroke of genius in my book and certainly gelled with the narrative well. It feels like the devs were trying to nail that 90s martial arts cop drama vibe, and if so, they absolutely succeeded. Its action and set pieces feel over the top in just the right way, while the hook and vibe of Hong Kong feels grounded and immersive. It's not as big an open world as its contemporaries, but it did feel a lot more close-knit and therefore alive. There is a lot to see and do in this game, and for the most part, all feeds into some form of progression. Discovering statues hidden in the world, for example, will grant you access to new moves and combos, so encourages exploration. And while exploring, there is always a generous helping of side content to get stuck into, levelling you up further. It just felt like a really natural and well-implemented progression system that, at least with me, really worked with my particular playstyle. If I had to boil down the style of combat at play here, it would be Batman Arkham meets Yakuza. It's not quite as deep as the Batman games, nor is it as humorous as the Yakuza games, but it does feature the ability to utilise the environment to your advantage, and always felt satisfying getting into fights. Not so much when you pick up a gun though. Thankfully, as mentioned earlier, that takes a bit of a backseat in Sleeping Dogs, and in my opinion is all the better for it. Trying to surmise my thoughts on this game for the sake of this video, I realise that I'm not even sure I can accurately describe what it is that made me fall in love with this game so much. I know it's not the gunplay or even its graphics, 
Being a cross-gen release, it is starting to show its age a little in 2023, even with the remastered Definitive Edition. Maybe it's the combat, the city of Hong Kong itself, or the wacky characters you meet, but something about this game just sticks with you. You'll just have to take my word for it and give it a go yourselves, I guess. And if you do, let me know what you think, as I literally don't know anyone who's played it. Most people I ask haven't even heard of it. Wait! Get over here now! What's going on, Winston? It's Benny, manager of Club Bam Bam, old friend of mine. Now he's working for Dog Eyes! That Ham Gartan is getting back at us for taking his minibus route. Look, I'll go talk to Benny, make him see reason. Yeah. Yeah, wait, you go do that. <laughs> And there you have my personal top 10 list of criminally underrated action games on the PS4. I'd love to hear what you guys think, and if I've committed the criminal act of my own by not including your favourite underrated action game, then do please let me know down in the comments. I'll be keeping it PlayStation with the next few uploads, so if that's something that might interest you, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to keep updated. But that's all for now folks, thank you for watching, and until next time, take care, be good, and game on.